Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, session. Uh, my name is, sorry, I'm sorry if I said it, I got distracted for a second, but my name is Varun Malik. I'm going to switch off my uh, chat panel. Uh, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of Consolidon. Consolidon is a new age consulting firm. New age in that uh, when you go to a traditional consulting firm, it's a partner, a large consulting firm. You have a partner or a director who understands the client's requirements, uh, who uh, sort of is the front face. And when they win the project, the project is normally delivered uh, by consultants within their organization, within their team, right? Um, in our case, uh, our partners go and understand the requirement, but the project is actually delivered uh, by a senior expert, someone from normally a boutique consulting firm, right? So someone senior uh, who understands the function or understands the industry and has been there, done that for several years. Um, uh, last year, uh, you know, was supposed to be a great, great year, right? 2020 was supposed to be a great year for everyone. Uh, obviously, that's not how things turned out. Um, uh, so after we recovered, obviously, we were affected as well initially. After we recovered from the initial shock of March and April, after Dubai lockdown, we decided that uh, we're going to spend at least 20% of our time. So all the consultants at Consolidon currently spend 20% of their time on initiatives to help the economy get back on track. Uh, last year, we focused on small businesses and micro businesses. Uh, so we started a project called the Superheroes Project, where we got about 700 business leaders from across the GCC to come in and support small businesses and micro businesses. This year, once larger organizations have started feeling the, uh, the burnout as well, um, we decided let's get all our, so we work with more than 300 boutique consulting firms. So let's get many of them to, uh, you know, put their brains together, put their thoughts and expertise together. And let's also talk to larger organizations and see how we can support in any way possible. Uh, so that's where the idea of Connected Insights was born. It's 70 consulting firms from our ecosystem that have gotten together and put this summit uh, together. We're going to be doing about 50 webinars and panel discussions over a seven day period. Uh, we have uh, five workshops as well that we're doing in the evening, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Dubai time. Uh, and we're really, really looking forward to meeting you all during uh, this summit. Um, just one quick housekeeping point or one or two quick housekeeping points before uh, I pass on to Stefan to uh, talk about why you're here and uh, about the main topic of today's agenda. Um, so one is we've, uh, rather than making you all attendees in this session, we're sort of Technically, we're making you panelists on Zoom. What this allows you to do is share your videos, uh, interact more with the speaker and the other attendees. Uh, it allows you to sort of wave to us and ask questions, or you can use the raise your hands feature on Zoom. So feel free to interact and ask questions during, during this uh, webinar. Uh, the other thing is we're doing quick giveaways during the, uh, during the webinar. Uh, two main giveaways, uh, you know, one will be at around 20, 25 minutes and one at around 40, 45 minutes. Um, the giveaway on 20, 25 minutes is we're doing uh, six workshops, like I said, during the summit. Each of these workshops, uh, we're normally charging $299 because it's a three hour workshop. Uh, but for the best participants from this workshop, right? People who ask the best questions, uh, to share good best practices. We're giving away three tickets free for the workshops. Uh, there's a short form that you'll have to complete, which my colleague will paste on the chat. Uh, so please look out for that. Um, the, the other giveaway is we have some, uh, some people from corporates here who we'd like to speak during our next web summit. So we're doing the second edition. This is the first edition of Connected Insights. We're doing the second edition in May. Uh, so what we'd like to do is invite some of you to speak during that summit. And there's another short form that you have to fill for that. So we'll give it away at around 40, 45 minutes. So without further ado, um, Stefan, I'm going to hand over to you. 
uh, really looking forward to your session. Thanks so much, Varun. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Before I start, Varun, do you want me to catch up time or do you want me to take 45 minutes from now? 45. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Let's spend this time and think about how we can all and how you can make customer centricity your superpower. Before we dive into this and share some of the commonalities across sectors, let me briefly introduce myself. So as you've seen, my name is Stefan Osthaus. Um, I am an independent consultant and par part of the Consolidon Boutique Network. On Friday last week, it was our eighth birthday over here at Experience 5. And until eight years ago, I was the global head of customer experience at Symantec, back then the fourth largest software company. Um, in a union of one role in one person, three roles in one person, I was also the head of global employee experience and the head of global customer and technical support. So we will speak a lot about how to make customers happy while not forgetting about employees and how to, where necessary, do this for large audiences um, of consumers, of B2B, in the public sector, we're going to speak about citizen experience and some of these things. In my world, customer and employee experience are two sides of the same coin. And in my world, things are simple. Things are not very complicated. And particularly, customer centricity has a lot to do with common sense, which we will nail down today and give you a chance to take down a few notes and get going, unless you're already wide into your customer experience journey and advance on your maturity. Um, in the past eight years, I had the benefit of working with large global brands. This is my, my focus. <clears throat> so I work in the tech sector with companies like Cisco, like Symantec. I work in heavy machinery like Heidelberg in the um, patient experience healthcare area like Lilly, like Astellas, in the telco area, Deutsche Telekom, Saudi Telekom. You see some of the names there. So this is where... Um, uh, I, I had the experience of showing centricity across B2B and B2C. We uh, engage heavily in healthcare and with uh, organizations like the General Organization for Social Insurance in Saudi and other ministries. We've also done a lot of work in the public sector. So we're, we're going to be able to identify quite a few things that uh, these areas have in common. So now I'm in Germany, um, at least I'm based here with my company. As you can see on the slide, I work across the planet. <clears throat> and um, when I look at the sectors, B2B, B2C, the public sector, be it customs, be it the police force, be it public insurance um, or services that other ministries provide to citizens. And when I look at healthcare, there are some very obvious commonalities that we can all leverage when we want to become more customer centric. So in the next 40 minutes, when I speak about customers, I mean private consumers, I mean, com I mean companies buying from us, I mean citizens uh, in uh, social um, environments who want to get a return on investment for the tax dollars they pay or they don't pay depending on where they live. And we speak, we'll speak about patients and how they want to recover. So let's do a quick poll and find out with uh, so many participants in the group here, which sector do you work in? So if we can um, start the poll for half a minute here and give everyone a chance to click. If you work across several sectors with your company, pick the one um, that contributes the biggest revenue. And if you are a consultant, uh, the last option is yours when you work with more companies providing services to them. <clears throat> Good. Let's do this for another five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Thank you very much. So a lot of B2B, a lot of B2C, about half of you uh, work in the commercial sector, <clears throat> nobody in the healthcare sector, um, some of you in the public sector and quite a few consultants or service providers across. No matter um, that mix, please feel free 
whenever you run across a question or when you have a sh uh, best practice you wanna share or a pain point you learned from, uh, just jump in, unmute yourself and let us know. <clears throat> so one thing all of these sectors have in common <clears throat> is a very fundamental thing, but this, if nothing else, should drive your customer centricity. All of your customers have expectations when they come to you, no matter which sector they're in. And these expectations will determine their satisfaction in the future. Because in the most simple way, you can reduce customer satisfaction and customer centricity to a mathematical equation. You can say satisfaction equals reality minus expectation. Let me give you a real life example of that. A few years ago, I traveled to New York with my family and I took my back then 14 year old daughter with me and I said, Pumpkin, what do you want to experience when we go to New York for four days? And she said, oh, I would love to fly in a helicopter and see New York from above. I definitely want to see the Statue of Liberty. Then we have this slightly strange habit in our family to do jigsaw puzzles of the destinations we travel to. So we had just finished the Brooklyn Bridge back then. And my daughter said, I want to take the same picture as the jigsaw puzzle. And I want to shop. Obviously, all 14-year-old girls want to shop. So as we arrived, we had luckily pre-booked a ticket for the helicopter. So here's my daughter being very happy. We saw the Statue of Liberty, check, all done. We spent a ridiculous amount of time on the Brooklyn Bridge waiting for as few people as possible to be in the photo and took the identical photo than the jigsaw puzzle we took. We shopped till we dropped and until then everything was fine. But the moment we found the unexpected Nutella cafe this trip turned into a dream come true. And after we came home, guess what my daughter talked about? None of the first four experiences, but she spoke about the Nutella Cafe. Now, that is the proof in the pudding that satisfaction equals reality minus expectation. And you've noticed this yourself. If you don't expect much for an evening out and you just go there, chances are it turns out to be really cool. But if you've been looking forward to that for months and it doesn't actually match or exceed these huge expectations, you might come home quite disappointed. The scary thing about expectations when you think about your customers is they grow over time. So many of you might think about your competitors. Stop that. Your customers don't compare you with your competitors because they don't buy from your competitors, they buy from you. Compare yourself with other industries, with the Amazons, with the public uh, services in some of the countries you serve in, with uh, the airlines or the other services your customers use. Let's look as mail as one of the um, examples of growing expectations. When online ordering started, everyone was hell of excited about this friendly man coming to your doorstep and delivering a parcel. So you didn't have to walk out in the rain here in Germany or the boiling heat in, in the Emirates. Then all of a sudden you had more services to choose from and all of a sudden you had preferences. You liked Hermes more than DHL or Amazon more than UPS. So you wanted a choice. Then you became environmentally conscious and here in Germany now everyone wants the electrically operated service vehicles for their parcel. And then you want an experience um, to, to receive your parcel when you're not at home. Like in the US, Amazon will now deliver into your refrigerator if you provide them with a key or a door code. And last but not least, we have now experiments where car manufacturers cooperate with DHL and the DHL guy can open your trunk and deliver your parcel into your car while you're in the office. And of course, we're all waiting for our parcel to arrive via drone on our balcony, front porch or backyard. So as you can see, in just the course of two decades, this has completely turned around from a person-driven convenience thing to a multi-dimensional set of expectations that you, if you ship, now all of a sudden have to deal with as well. So the two things 
that are true in all sectors that we can take away from here is satisfaction equals reality minus expectation. Um, if I were a friend of tattoos, that would probably be tattooed on my shoulder. Then we learned expectations grow. And then we know this is true in all sectors you operate in or all sectors you consult with in your organizations. Now, if the foundation is the same across all of the sectors, is the approach to customer centricity also the same? The typical consultant will say, no, you have to adapt to all kind of specificness in your sector and every company is different and everything. And oh, we need to do first very complicated things before we can make you customer centric. I personally think that's rubbish. I personally think that the approach to making customer centricity your superpower is always the same. You have a strategic decision to make. You have to look after the culture in your organization. You need to put some people behind your mouth so that when you say you want to be customer centric, you have at least a few people orchestrating this. Then you as a leader need to follow up with this as well. And you need to learn how to listen. And these things are actually also not very complicated. Let's start with um, the status of your customer centricity. And if you're a consultant, you can either opt out of this question or you can let us know where you stand. Look at the options because customer centricity is a journey. Have you started or not? Have you done a few things but not really gotten an initiative going? Have you launched something and you're really happy with the progress? Have you launched something, but it's stalling at the moment? Or are you really one of the pros already that can share a lot of best practices as we go? Awesome, a few people not started yet. will take a lot away from today. A few people who are on the verge of starting an initiative. Also here, a lot of tips and advice for you. The program is going well, wonderful. We'll give you a lot of advice on the next steps to take. Needs more energy. I'll point out the pitfalls where we usually struggle and, struggle and how to avoid them. And far advanced, we have a few here as well. Please chime in with your best practices as we go. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Cool. So let's close this and keep going. Start. Let's start with strategy. Do you need to be customer centric? Is that a prerogative for every organization? The answer is actually no. You don't need to be customer centric. There are many strategy options. You can, for example, totally focus on market entry and internationalization like Uber. You can throw a lot of investment behind it, sort out your technology platform and everything else and think about customer centricity later on. You can try to be first to market. If you work in one of the companies contributing to the flying taxi plans, then you definitely want the first yellow cap in the air just to make the media hype. You can follow price or quality leadership. If you make pens between Big and Mont Blanc, there is a world in quality, but also a world in pricing. You can um, follow digitalization. If you're in banking, you don't do this voluntarily. You're under such pricing pressure that you need to digitalize no matter what. And customer centricity, customer centricity sometimes falls off the table as you do. You can have an exit fantasy. The guys who bought Siri, uh, who built Siri, Siri doesn't like me. When I dictate, it usually completely understands the most off wording and I embarrass myself when I send it before I proofread it, but the guys who build it didn't have customer centricity in mind. They wanted to be bought by Apple as quickly as possible. We call this an exit fantasy in your, in your um, company plan. <clears throat> you can grow at all, at all costs. There's an organization called Scientology who engage in um, personal development trainings. Many people say personal manipula manipulation. Some countries consider them a, um, a religion or a church. Some countries uh, consider them organized crime. No matter what you think about them, they grow at all costs. Customer centricity is not a um, not even an afterthought there. And if you, as I have, little children, 
then a few years ago, they were into these colorful rubber bands, loom bands. And this thing, everyone knew would go away within one year. So if you're in this business, you know you have a limited time during which you need to monetize. And after that, you're gone. Or you set yourself up for customer centricity. And in my industry, you always need to say Ritz-Carlton if you speak about customer centricity, because they're the ultimate example. But every company can be customer centric. So you see, you don't need to be customer centric. There are many other strategic options, but it's the most sustainable. Many of the organizations who go through any of the other phases ultimately will end up focusing on customer centricity. And this is why some of you said we have just started, even though you might be well-established organizations who exist for many years. If well, anyone, go ahead. Sorry, Stefanos. So that's a very good point, right? And currently that is our reality where we've been very disruptive in the market, quick to innovate, quick to do everything um, and we grow at all costs. But now we find ourselves where we're like, okay, wait, we've done all of this, but oh, we actually need to make sure we retain our customers mm. and we turn all our customers into ambassadors. How do we do that? Um, yeah. So that's a really good slide that you just presented. I'm glad you say this, Carolyn, and you didn't do anything wrong because very often you need to secure your space in the market first, and then you do all the other things that are good, like motherhood and apple pie. And customer centricity is something that will now help you secure, as you said, um, the customers you have and win more and utilize the ones you want as ambassadors for word of mouth and recommendation. So mm -hmm. let's see how you best set this up. and. Um, Good luck with that. Please let me know how the Thank other you. tips will apply to you and if they resonate. Um, if you need to convince somebody in the organization, Carolyn and everyone else who is against that and says customer centricity is about hugging a tree and singing your name, then here are some facts for the CFO. This stuff has been researched to the nth degree. So if you need a list of um, uh, research that we've collected, send me an email. My email is the same as you see at the bottom, info at, and it will show up further down the presentation as well. We can share all the sources behind that. It has been proven that CX drives revenue significantly by at least a point by net promoter score increase. It reduces churn. So as Carolyn just said, she wants to prevent her existing customers from churning, from losing. And so CX does that, customer centricity does that, frequency will go up. And here's a whole list of other things that customer centricity will impact positively as we go. Now, this is your strategy. You have now decided you want to be more customer centric. Everyone will now say, yeah, but the culture, are we really ready? As a leader or as one of the key influencer in your organization, you have, not much to keep in mind regarding culture. It's actually really straightforward. First of all, never, ever, 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 let me emphasize this, never, ever, ever launch a customer centricity program that is not at the same time an employee centricity program. I said that earlier, two sides of the same coin. Right? You can stand on stage at the annual kickoff in Las Vegas like a crazy CEO, jump up and down, wave your arms and say, sell, 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 customer, customer, customer. And other than the cocktails in the evening, the audience will not get very excited. If you jump up and down and say, sell, 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 customer, 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 and at the same time, we want to be the best place to work, you will get enthusiasm from your employees and they will follow you, follow your banner and follow you on the journey that you want to embark upon. Richard Branson is just one of the people who say that. I fully agree with him. Happy employees will create happy customers. There's also a very pragmatic thing, let me tell you. Five quizillion things in your organization go wrong. You don't know which they are. Your employees don't do, so ask them. Ask your employees, make them part of that improvement journey. They will tell you where the room for improvement sits. In order to do that, you need to have a listening program. When you travel, sit in a room and invite everyone to come in for pizza and ask them what to improve. 
have more than an annual survey. Annual surveys to your employees suck. They are like rising down a highway with 200 miles per hour and only looking outside of the window every 60 seconds. It just doesn't suffice. You need more than that. And it can be very pragmatic. Trust your employees, empower them. Don't build the processes in your organization for the two fraudulent employees you had five years ago. Build the processes in your organization for the 99.9% .9 of the wonderful employees you have today. Empower them, let them make decisions for your customers as they move through the customer journey together with your customers. Let them resolve problems and involve them as you develop new services, new products. Don't be an ivory tower. Bring the frontline employees in as you design your products, your processes, your improvements and everything. Make them involved. Don't make them affected only. This is the four things that will drive your culture to perfection, it's as easy as that. Obviously, execution is difficult. Uh, Go ahead, Caroline. Sorry, uh, the previous slide. So that's one of the things that we we are confused about, and and uh, I'm number one to do that. Is this now the responsibility of the human resources department, or the CX, or customers? In, in in my world, the CX guys and gals get very excited about this and then we bring HR in mm -hmm. to not do this over their head. What you see in most HR departments ever since a decade and a half ago is that they have been slaughtered to the bare minimum contact people to headquarters now. All of the HR business partnerships have been outsourced to Romania or India. All of the um, the, the problem solving has been pushed down into management. So in most organizations, you see barebone HR remains, remnants of what it has been before. That doesn't mean you can do it without HR. So involve them and build a pragmatic joint approach where CX helps a lot because HR doesn't have usually a lot of resource to now also start a voice of the employee program and mm -hmm. also involve them in all kinds of suggestion programs. And since the tools and methods are the same in CX, involve HR, but be ready to help them a lot. Okay, thank you. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Okay, now let's look at the organization. Um, if Richard Branson gets a slide, I want one as well. And my, my favorite phrase that has been coined when I started in customer experience is customer centricity is not a department. It's an attitude. And it came along with my first boss who was so excited that I was the first head of customer experience back then at Symantec. He said, first of all, we need to look at the user interface of Norton Internet Security and it sucks, it needs to improve. And if the guys in, in user um, uh, experience don't get what we tell them, I will make them report into you and then you make sure it improves. After that, we will speak um, to the subscription model, the sales department. We need to clean this up. And if they don't understand that, I will make them report into you and you can look after that and fix it and so on. If once he got to the fifth or sixth group he wanted to have report into me in the future, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. If we do all the work in customer experience, nothing will get done and the program is dead before we even start. We need to make sure people want to do that and they understand why we do that and we can't whip them over the target line. So uh, if, if you share this approach, talk to everyone in your organization and let them know this is about the customer experience team being a conductor, like in an orchestra. You don't play a flute, you don't play a violin and you don't play the piano, but you agree with everyone that today it's gonna be Antonin Dvorak that we're gonna play and you tell everyone when to start and not to be too fast. And this way you speak about joint methods, joint tools, joint approaches, but all improvement, all work takes place in the organization itself. That doesn't mean you don't need a head of customer experience. So when you're grown up um, and your um, customer experience initiative is mature, you will, had, you will have best practice, one head of customer experience. You will not have a huge team. 
but you will have a liaison ambassador into every region and every function of your organization. We call those champions. And maybe you have an assistant and an analyst yourself. So you have a very small, up to a handful of people reporting into you. Don't make this a bigger team because otherwise you will do the project management, the project execution, the ROI calculation, and more and more and more and more. And if function A sees that you do that, they will withdraw and they will say, I, 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 I'm so busy, I can't do this improvement. And the next function will pull back. And all of a sudden, everyone is disappearing out of the window and you're alone and you will drive your customer centricity initiative for three more days before it dies. So takeaway, organization is a small team. Involve everyone else and make sure they take the work into the functions, into the regions. So speeding up and the last point before we speak about governance is listen, understand and act. This is the engine. You can have different opinions between preferring BMW or Mercedes-Benz for all kinds of reasons, but they all share an engine that moves the car forward. The engine of customer centricity is called listen, understand, act. And in order to do that, you usually, you might have heard this, you draw, you draw the customer journey of your customers. This is a customer journey for the health sector. So you see the phases in the first line, then you see the steps, then you um, have the feelings, the emotions and needs. You will uh, map down the touch points, where does the patient experience these things. You will start to um, write down what you want to measure and where you need to measure. You can even with this funny line at the bottom, evaluate how well you're doing. And let me show you just a very simple one for a university, same picture pretty much, right? So customer journey maps are the same across all sectors. You want to walk a mile in your customer's shoes and really understand what this map looks like. And you do this with colleagues from all areas of the organization. And trust me, at the end of every customer journey workshop, people go like, wow, that was fun. I, I knew all of that, but I never had the full picture. And then if you want to listen at the bottom of the slide in the red area, you can say, okay, oh, this part is important. We should do a survey here. In this part, we don't have to do a survey. We have all the information from our contact center. Let's use this data. Let's look at that. So the customer journey map is your first step to understanding where and how you want to listen. Even more important though is if you listen, you need to do something with it. If you plan not to react to what you listen to, don't ask a question. Because chances are somebody will pour their heart out to you and say, when I used your product on my wooden table, it ruined the wood. And nobody answered to me in customer support. I will sue you. Now, if you say, oh, this is one star out of five, done. This drives down our average from 4.8 to 4.79, ha. Huh? Not too bad, not to worry, it's a statistic, let's move on. You will miss a lot of opportunities because first of all, you need to look at the open text feedback. Somebody is giving you a hint that something really went wrong. Best practice is to get in touch with everyone who leaves a bad rating or a bad review. We have learned with several customers that if you do this right, the customer will be more loyal after you reached out to that person than before your product ruined the table. Let me give you a real life, an exa a real life example. At Norton, customer support, we supported 120 million customers worldwide. We had 6 million live interactions every year. That's a pile of data you can work with. So once we were done and once we had driven that promoter score up by 30 points, we could measure that somebody who had a problem with their product and contacted our technical support walked away more loyal than customers who had never had a single problem with their product. This is when my boss said, oh, let's put some bugs into the product. It makes people happy. And I said, no, 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 don't do that. So if you do problem resolution right, you will leave customers happier than before. And a Band-Aid is important. Do something with the table, fix it. But many people stop here. 
Many people call the customer, fix the table and walk away and say, I've made a customer happy. There's two more things you need to do. You need to put in automatic alerts. For example, the word legal, suing, attorney, uh, court of law should raise an alert to your legal department so that they can jump in and do something. Um, <clears throat> if you're in the medical space and somebody says suicide, kill myself, not worth living, then you should um, pop up a message to a suicide helpline or other things that you deem responsible in the situation. So if you're getting more responses than somebody can read in real time, make sure you put in alerts. And most of the voice of the customer technology that's out there in the market can do this. Make this a buying criteria for your voice of the customer um, technology. And last but not least, react. Change your product to not destroy wooden tables in the future. We call this closed loop. We call this root cause analysis and elimination. Don't settle for single case resolution. Um, eliminate the underlying cause as well. All right. Here's the last point I want to make before we open it up and discuss some of your challenges and how to best approach them. The last thing you need to make sure if you are a leader in your organization and you've kicked off your customer centricity initiative, you've chosen the right strategy, you have set up everything to um, actually listen, trust, empower, and involve your employees so your culture is set up, you first of all tap somebody on the shoulder in the organization space and say, please do that as a hobby. You're my favorite leader. You're the head of business development. Make us more customer centric. And you have understood that at least a year later, you need to put in a full time head of customer experience. You have done the whole listen, understand act and are now collecting feedback from employees and from customers. Now it's time for the governance. And governance, again, very straightforward means every leader is involved. The CEO is the sponsor with responsibilities. When he speaks to the town hall of all employees, he should speak about the customer. When um, achievements are there to celebrate, then the CEO should join in to celebrate. He should award improvements on the customer experience uh, side. Customer centricity should be on the agenda of every meeting. The customer should be in the room with every decision that is made in the organization. It can't always be pro-customer, but you should be aware of what you're doing to your customers with the decisions. And your employees should think about the customer at every workshop, every innovation session they have. Some of them do this through, with a chair that has a customer's name on it or even a, a, a dummy customer sitting there. Um, no matter what you do, just make sure that your governance includes everyone in the organization dealing with the topic. You have not outsourced this to your CX team. You have asked your CX team to coordinate it for all of you, but not um, to relieve you of your own responsibilities in this space. So in summary, um, we spoke about the commonalities in the strategy, culture, organization, listen and governance space. If you do these things, you will have years of pipeline of great ideas on how you can improve. It doesn't get more complicated than that. The solution to your problems might get more complicated, but the approach is as straightforward as that. Let's hear back from you. If you agree, if you have made different experiences, or even more important, where do you struggle? And remember to unmute yourself if you want to speak. Okay, I'll go again. Thanks, Carolyn. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I'm hijacking this. this no, you're the icebreaker for us. That's awesome. So from our side, you know, where, where do we struggle the most is where do we start? We've got the vision. Uh, I put the strategy down. But it's like, I don't know, it's like, where, where do we start? Mm. 
Good question. Um, usually, in that situation, you don't see the forest because of the trees. You see so many solutions you could buy. You feel as if you don't have a big survey mechanism. You feel as if you're very busy at the moment with an acquisition, a new ERP system introduction. Everyone's busy anyway. So that is a moment that is difficult to get out of and do something. And um, particularly, the listening bit is something that you can do extremely pragmatically. Let me give you an example. We started work with a large pharmaceutical company um, a year ago, and they hadn't started their customer centricity journey yet. And they were wondering how to start. What we did is they had an all employee town hall, not a town hall, a two day all employee workshop. Um, it was intended to be on a Mediterranean island, a little bit something like an incentive annual kickoff. And thanks to Corona, it was all virtual. Still funny though, they had a cocktail workshop. Um, but what I'm getting at is we secured 45 minutes in that two-day agenda and literally asked two questions to every employee. What do you think the company could do better to be more customer-centric? And what could you change as of Monday to be more customer centric yourself? So not everyone has that opportunity, but within 45 minutes, we had about 800 bits of feedback, 800 bits of insight where the company could improve. We then formed a small team of volunteers that come together every two weeks. We, um, as the consultancy, aggregate those 600 bits of feedback and say, look, the majority of the people say topic A, B, C, and D. And we designed little projects around A, B, C, and D. And we invited volunteers to work on these projects and get going and come up with a proposal. And within a few months, we have the first improvement initiatives going, even without any survey mechanism without any big infrastructure. So the takeaway from that is just do something. You can also bring 20 people into a room and buy pizza for them and do a whiteboard session and say, what are your ideas? What's getting in your way to be the best customer centric employee? After one hour, you will have 45 items you can start with. And then later on, you do all the fundamentals. You do a customer journey man, a mapping workshop. You design a more holistic voice of the customer program. You ask your employees, why are you so full of great ideas? And they will say, I didn't know where to go with them. And you create a suggestion program in the organization. Slowly but steadily, you improve what you want to do. But the most important thing is get going. Do that first thing. Ask a few people and find out how you can improve. Does that make sense, Carolyn? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else with a challenge that they're struggling with in their customer centricity? Hello, I have one. Um, uh, let's say, how can we uh, get the attention from business from other business units? When I say they, when I, well, what I mean is exactly. Uh, we do measure and we, good, uh, we get the feedback from our customer and employees. We analyze it, we consolidate it, and then we bring up, uh, we come up with uh, some uh, important initi initiative, uh, but we don't own them. Uh, I mean, we don't, uh, we don't own those initiatives. Business mm -hmm. units do. So how can we get the buy-in from the, those business units in order to work with, the, the, with these initiatives? Great question, Fahad. This is the biggest question for every head of customer experience. Now, here are a few tips. First of all, you on average have between five and seven business units you work with, and you will find that there are three groups of business unit. The first group is very excited and likes what you're doing, Fahad, and wants to support you, maybe one or two business units. 
Then there is the second group of business units who want to wait and see what the results are first. They have so many things on their plate. Maybe this is just the latest crazy idea. In principle, they like customer centricity, but they want to wait for some encouraging news first. And the third group may not like the idea at all. They might be disappointed with the company. They might not like you or your boss, but for whatever reason, they will not support you. So you always have these three groups. And what we as customer experience leaders tend to do is we spend our time on the last group trying to convince them and trying to win their love. It's called the popcorn effect. If you make popcorn in your microwave, you will always have a few um, corn uh, bits in there that don't pop and that are hard and you can break a tooth on them. If you leave your popcorn in the microwave too long to have the last bit of corn pop, everything else will be charcoal. A charcoal. If you spend too much effort on the third business uh, unit group that don't want to support you, the first two groups will lose their mojo and will not support you anymore. So the first takeaway is start with the first group, grab one or two business groups and create your success stories. Run away, don't wait for the last one. The second advice is that um, you uh, need to uh, secure the results from um, the executive management. So if nobody wants to support you, it's about time the CEO speaks to their, their leaders, his or her leaders, and says, listen, business unit leader one, two, and three, Fahad has some very interesting insight. I want you to react to that. And the third bit of support is, uh, the third advice uh, to support you is, in building your results, in coming up with the insight that you generate, make sure people from the business unit are involved. So let's say business unit one should improve their financial processes to improve customer centricity. And you have found that out. Make sure people from finance have been in the project contributing to that insights. Then the leader of the financial business unit will support what you come with more as if nobody in his team has ever seen that before. So in summary, don't wait for the laggers. Start with the pioneers. Secondly, get the support from your executive team. They need to help as well. And thirdly, make sure that your initiative building, your gaining insight is coming together from uh, contributions from everyone in those business units as well. Does that help? Does that make sense, Fahad? Yes, thank you. It's very You're welcome. welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for the question. Okay, I think we have time for one more, if you have one more. And then obviously for everyone else, you see my email address on the slide right now. Feel also free to ping me and then we can always have a cup of tea uh, over Teams to discuss your question afterwards. But one more we can do now if you like. Stefan, thank you very much for the, the session. That was very informative. Thanks, Alan. Um, a, a challenge that I've come across with a number of organizations is that they pay lip service to the whole concept of customer centricity, even to the extent that they might have a head of customer experience. But in reality, that person is lost in the organization at a reasonably middle or junior level and doesn't have the authority or responsibility to take the whole topic forward. So how have you come across that situation and how do you deal with it? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Like every strategic option, sustainability, social responsiveness, customer centricity, every CEO is free to make a fake commitment. If only the CEO buys one electric uh, powered car and parks it behind the building and that's all the ecological responsibility, then it's a fake strategy decision. And the same is true in organizations that introduce an NPS survey so that the CEO can brag about his high NPS while playing golf with other CEOs, but nothing happens. And the head of customer experience is the chief survey officer of the NPS survey that happens once a year. <clears throat> so if you see intent behind that, uh, walk away, 
find a new job, find a new client, because obviously somebody in the organization has made the decision they don't want to be customer centric. If you see um, lack of information, what we often do is we do executive engagement sessions where we show the return on investment. We show how experience data and bottom line data correlate. We show how the organization itself becomes more resilient if they are customer centric because future disruptive changes in the industry of that organization will have lesser impact if the organization is resiliently customer centric. And usually if there is good intent, the executive team will afterwards be more um, committed to customer centricity and they will understand that they can't just drop it on somebody's shoulder, that everyone in the organization needs to be um, involved. So it's your responsibility and challenge to understand, is it bad intent? or lack of information. In the first case, run. In the second case, run an executive engagement session, which is difficult because you need to get one, two, three, four hours out of the executive team decision, uh, agenda. Um, and that's the first um, proof in the pudding. If you get that time, then you can already see, oh, there is good intent. They want to learn more about it. But it's definitely a 50-50 case. Half of the folks who have that um, fake customer centricity thing up don't want more. And the other half can be stimulated through some executive education. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Kanika, Varun, I think we wrap it up in the interest of time with that. As I mentioned, everyone else, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Um, thank you so much for your uh, interest, your sharing of best practices. I hand it back to you, Varun. Thank you so much, Stefan, for that great session. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so everyone, if we can take a quick photo, so if you can fix your hair and get on your videos, if that's okay, and we can, Kanika can take a quick photo uh, because I've joined from my phone. I'm just... You are mute, Varun. You pressed the wrong button. Sorry, we can't hear you anymore. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can hear you and we're all getting ready to wave. <laughs> okay, perfect. So can everyone, if your videos are on, Kanika will go, uh, going to take a quick photo. So one, two, three, customer centricity. Yay. <laughs> we need more cameras on. Let's do this again. A few more cameras on, Varun. Let's try this with a few cameras on. Here we go. Maybe a few more. That's awesome. Thank you, folks. Now, Kanika, count us down again. Yes. So Perfect. three, two, one, and taking a photo. customer centricity again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank so you, much everyone. Thank you. Thank See you, you so later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.